Many people are astonished to learn that one of the largest and most active volcanoes on Earth is located on the frozen continent of Antarctica. The volcano was named by James Clark Ross after his ship HMS Erebus which together with HMS Terror sailed into the Ross Sea in January 1841. What is even more astonishing is that Mount Erebus is just one of at least over 138 known volcanoes in Antarctica. They are clustered along the rim of the West Antarctic Rift. Most of them are buried under up to 4,000 metres of ice. The West Antarctic Rift system can be tracked by geophysics, extending over 3,000 kilometres of West Antarctica. Only two volcanoes, Mount Erebus and Mount Melbourne, are active above the ice. But there is increasing evidence of active volcanic activity underneath the ice cap. Erebus is a large alkaline stratovolcano with a volume of more than 2,000 cubic kilometres. The summit is at an elevation of 3,794 metres or 12,450 feet. The summit region of Erebus Volcano above 3,200 metres is a plateau nearly 4 kilometres in diameter, representing the remnants of two episodes of caldera collapse dated around 80,000 years ago and 25,000 years ago and subsequent infilling with younger lava flows. The summit plateau also contains two craters. The main crater, up to 600 metres across, which hosts the lava lake, and the side crater, 250 metres across, which contains areas of hot ground and weird ice formations. The constantly active, long-lived lava lake resides in the inner crater, which is a pit within the main crater. The following clip, and all succeeding clips like it, are from the webcam operated by the Mount Erebus Volcano Observatory, which is part of the New Mexico University of Technology. Erebus Lava Lake is the site of sporadic explosions associated with the rupture of large gas bubbles. Many attempts have been made to sample that gas. The only person to have survived a descent into the crater and successfully sample the gas was volcanologist Dr Harry Keyes. The following is compiled from a lecture he gave during an Aurora expedition to the Ross Sea in February 2008. Good afternoon, thank you for coming along. This, this first uh, clip is from that camera. I guess you saw in the, um, in the query lab at McMurdo, Karen showed uh, some videos of the eruption, of eruption to the of Erebus? Most, did many of you see that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so um, this is this is from the same same site, what we call Shackleton's Ten. And um, it's it's in January 2002. Here's the lava lake. Here's what's called Burner's Vent. You can see red there. This used to be called Active Vent. Now I've been Active Vent. And there's, this is the... These are the molten blobs of lava coming out and 
hitting the ground, hitting the snow, and this, and of course they are hot. Goes without saying, and um, <laughs> as they land on the snow, everything turns to steam, and you can't see anything. So that's that's pretty. It's, it's pretty good. We've got the technology to show this because most of the time you can't. We don't have it, so we're going to get. So this is the rim of the fire pit, or what we call where the lava lake is. And the objective for many years has been get down to either here or to here and sample gas. Sample gas. Send your assistant. Why? <laughs> so here we go, last one. Here's the, here's the rim of the fire pit. The ring of the fire pit. The ring of the fire pit. Woo! So this is a relatively small eruption, but there's, there's, a, there's a six, six to twelve of those a day, on, on average. Okay. Oh, the scale, okay. Last one. The fire pit is about, the lava lake is about 50 metres across. This is a telephoto lens from 400 metres away, looking down, looking down to, into, into the whole, most, this is most of the inner crater. Up here there's a wall, a cliff, to the main crater, and this is this is the fire pit. So the lake is an oblique, an oblique view. The lava lake is sort of like this, and it's 50 meters from the to there. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about Erebus. It's a it's an incredible volcano, southernmost volcano in the world, a, um, a very active volcano. It's got a very a persistent lava lake in it. And it's very high uh, and very cold. And this is a view from the from the air. Uh, we've we've we looked from this down here. That's the fang we could see as we came out uh, yesterday. Was it yesterday? Yeah. 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 And you can see the little bit of plume. There's Mount Sarah behind. That's a good view. Yeah. And here's a view of Cape Royds Hut in December 2006. This is where um, Mawson and David and Co. From Chaplin's expedition climbed up to Erebus. That took about eight days from memory. So this is where this is where the restoration was going on. Previous summer, when the when the uh, main program of restoration of Royds Hut was finished, that looks maybe look a little bit different now. This is my wife. And um, in 1978, we had our first weekend together, our first night really together at Cape Evans Hut or near near Cape Evans Hut. We came out here during the day. Here's another photograph from um, from the air, Washington Post photograph with the shadow of Erebus. Is both maybe both at island. Fantastic! You can see the crater full of steam. So we were seeing that plume yesterday. Is the fang? The colours. This is in the sun. This is in the shade. This is at uh, taking about two o'clock in the morning. Here's the shadow out there. Is that what you meant, Bruce? Okay, so Erebus has been there ever since, obviously, a long time, and Ross discovered it in 1841. And a colleague of mine, a friend of mine, as a PhD student from Victoria University in Wellington, went up there in 1971-72. Uh, he was camped at the Fang, and he climbed up first day. He was, he was, he's a volcanologist, he was studying the, the volcanic rocks. He said, let's go up there next year. It was just my first year, so we, we put an expedition together, a New Zealand expedition. Vuai uh, was Victoria University of Wellington Antarctic Expedition, number seven, the 17th. And so this was the first camp we had up there at um, just a little below the summit. Uh, but it was too high. And one of the guys got a, got a altitude sickness, a climate, um, lack of acclimatization, and he had to be flown down. It was a quite dramatic occasion. Uh, so then we learned we needed to acclimatize. So the second expedition, uh, and we're trying to get into the crater. Uh, more about that soon. The second expedition, we acclimatized at the Fang. This was the New Zealand French expedition. The French made this beautiful igloo system. And Phil and I came up later after I'd all done all this. This was a Christmas tree that one of the women on the Vuai expedition gave us. And then uh, that was unsuccessful. And then the third expedition was a New Zealand-US expedition. 
Uh, this was the first hut, because the US built this hut. And which is still there. This hut was, was quite important because our, our, our standard of living went up dramatically. Being, being a tent compared with being in a hut is just not really any comparison. Although we slept in tents, we, we cooked and hung out during the bad weather, which, which you have quite a lot of. And this is the current hut. 97, it was built in 1985 after the first hut was abandoned because in 1984 there was quite a big eruption and there were bombs all around here, new, new bombs all around mm -hmm. and it's a miracle that the hut never got hit by, by bombs so this is the current, current uh, outfit, this is December 06 two huts and here's the looking up towards the crater up here so sleeping in tents, this is down to my tent the helicopter arriving Helicopters are very important, obviously, that uh, we don't walk up like Shackle and Co did, well, well, other people have done. Always, always flying now. Sometimes they drive skidoos up and they've even taken huskies up. The Kiwis have taken huskies up. So we've not to hear about the decolonisation thing. Helicopters also um, are a powerful logistic tool. They're, they're the main workhorse in Antarctica. And if, you, if you've got access to a helicopter, you've got many advantages. And uh, here's, a, here's a photograph. We know that we used this helicopter the other day. Fantastic things for driving around in. Okay, the lava lake. The lava lake is arguably the biggest, uh, most amazing thing about Erebus. It's a very persistent lava lake. It's been, it's been there ever since Phil first went there in 1971. Although he didn't really confirm that he saw lava. We saw it in 1970. Two. And it's come and gone. Usually it's about this size. Oops. Usually it's about this this size. It's slowly convecting. You can when you when you you can feel the heat down here. When you're up in the Shacklands Ken where these photographs are taken, it's 300 meters away or 400 meters away. You can't feel the heat, but you can feel the heat from the inner crater room, which we'll see in a minute. Here's a series of pictures again, um, just just to get reinforce what we've been seeing. There's the lava lake erupting. These are the, these are the bombs flying around. Lots, of, lots and lots of them. Obviously the closer you go to the crater, the closer they are together. More likely you are to get hit if you're there. And here's, uh, here's the bomb, a bomb after it's landed. This is after it's landed on the outside of the crater. And my friend uh, poking it with an ice axe. They wrote the ice axes off. Now these, these ice axes are, are uh, separate from all the other ones at McMurdo. And uh, when, they, when they only give these ice axes to the guys that go out here of us, they don't give them to go out the field. So, so the lava lake's been studied for quite a few years. It's difficult to study. They've been using cameras on it, um, getting samples of the bombs, the crystals in it, trying to understand the evolution of the magma. And the lava lake, it's the, most, it's the easiest lava lake in the world to study, except you can't get right down to it. But it's got lots of other, other things, and, and so that's been a major subject of science. I'm not really going to go into more of that, I can talk about that later if you want. Seismicity, understanding the, the earthquakes associated with eruptions and precursor to eruptions, also a really important scientific tool. Seismometers are a major tool uh, for, for geophysical study to do with earthquakes and volcanoes and other things. This is a uh, seismogram from Erebus, from, uh, from Station E. Yeah, so these are different eruptions. And, and, you, and you can tell from the magnitude and the, the frequency content and, the, and the, the way the waveform evolves, you can tell uh, different things about the depth of the source of this noise and the type of type of noise, and so on. So now there's a huge network um, built up around the volcano after many years of trial and error. So this is the camera here that um, we saw the videos from at McCreary Lab, or the, the current generation of the camera. This is a, a, a fancy spectrometer, which is looking down and sampling the gas, measuring the gas, and can tell the difference between CO2 and SO2 and all the other uh, most of the other gases that they're interested in. Uh, so it's a, it's a major tool and it needs to be filled with liquid nitrogen about every 24 hours. 
So whatever the weather is, people have got to go up there and change it. And sometimes it's very, very cold. There's a tent for sheltering. It's very south of here, here too. And here's the network. Here's the current network of sites. Here's the, here's the lower hut. Um, the site was at Chaplin's Cairn. Uh, Chaplin's Cairn is there. This is, this is a various network of, um, of sites. Trying to get a different uh, different views of the lab of the uh, seismicity and therefore develop a three dimensional picture, uh, but or both in space and time of, of the eruptions. Um, here's another one of the sites. A lot of solar panels, experimental wind generators of different kinds. More solar panels, screws, brake machines. But the, this, these are the terrestrial version of the zodiac in Antarctica. <laughs> Okay, other things about Erebus, other science things about Erebus. The ozone hole, my, I think this is one of the better excuses my mate had. Um, he reckoned that Erebus was contributing to the ozone hole. Well, I pointed out to him that Erebus had been producing fluorine, that, that fluorine is one of the contributors, and chlorine, for thousands and thousands of years, yet we've only just seen the ozone hole. And he, he sort of moved on to change the subject. <laughs> so, so, um, yeah, so th these are the... This is, this is the ozone hole from October 07, not, not such a big one as the year before. And th these are the stratospheric clouds that are uh, part of the ozone hole story. And the hungi, one year, this is, uh, oh, this is 06, we used this, um, this uh, English PhD student, and she had a thermal camera to find where the warm ground was in the cyclone. <laughs> we <laughs> traded, we bartered a, um, a, a leg of lamb from the Scott-based cook, Put it in the hot ground, and, and 20, 22 hours later, we had a beautiful lamb. <laughs> Where did you get the banana leaves? The what? The, the banana, banana leaves. leaves? Yeah, they wrapped the banana. banana leaves. It's in the packet. Down here, I can't see. No. Oh, the banana leaf for the hangi. Yeah. No. New Zealanders, we don't use that. No, no. No, we just use sex. Is it, is it sex? <laughs> S-A-C-K. Who would go on a cruise with Australians? <laughs> anyway, the, probably the most, uh, well, I should say, the second most exciting thing about Erebus for me is, is going into the crater. And this is, this is a photograph that Karen took in 1978, just before we went in. She was the first woman into the crater. And uh, the Kiwis had, 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 had tried to go up before us, and they, they, they were, yeah, I guess we're talking about the months and the Scott and the same concept. Anyway, they, they were under-resourced and they went out in a hurry and the, bom the bombs covered, burnt all their ropes. Mm. Oh, yes. So um, wow. they waited for us then. Anyway, so this is the, this is the inner crater room, this, looking at the main crater. <coughs> so much up here, this is the main crater, inner crater room. And you first have to get down this wall. Well, not this particular point, but this, this wall. And then you go down the next part. So in 1972, we had our first attempt. We put the steel winch, heavy steel winch, and a tent up over it on the, on the crater rooms, and climbed down. Uh, we we absolutely we winched two guys down, one after another down here. Uh, and he sampled the first fume roll, which was unfortunately mostly H2O and a bit of CO2. It didn't teach him anything. What, what the idea was here was to try and understand the sample, the primitive gas. This is one of the theories for the evolution of all the water on the world is from volcanoes. And uh, only 30 years ago this was the major theory. This was leading, the leading contender for that, for the H2O. And so you had to try and find gas that wasn't contaminated by rainwater. Most volcanoes, the rain falls on them and percolates into the ground and comes back up with steam. So it's got a different isotopic signature. The idea was in Erebus you wouldn't have any rain, you'd have any melting, and so on and so on. So the second, so we did, we only got as far as that in the, in the first year. Second year we came out with a bigger winch, more people, and we established a, a climbing route down the main crater, quite, quite an easy climb, except the bottom needed a ladder. But unfortunately, there were too many eruptions, and 
Phil and I were in this tent one night and we heard bang and we heard this whistle. And it was this bomb coming with, oh, I hope that's not going to land on us. <laughs> anyway, it landed out here, so it was still warm the next day. So by that time we'd, we'd started to think maybe we wouldn't go down that year. <laughs> and so we had, we had another go in 1978-79. This was a, a New Zealand US expedition. And here's Verna going down. Oops. Verna going down on Abso. We, we decided, we were, most of us were climbers, and we thought, well, we carry winches and they're so heavy, you spent hours and, or days and days getting the winches into position. We thought we'd just go for a light rope, a rope technology, you know, um, abseiling down and then a pulley system that gets back up. Very quick. So here's Verna off, off going down. Here's the lava lake behind him. And so he's up here, Jesus. and the ropes are going down here, and he's down here. It's about here's the ropes. I guess he's just below the picture. Anyway, the mountain erupted. And this is uh, coming out, and uh, the bombs landing. This is not this particular eruption. Let's put this into the story. See the see the bombs landing, the steam coming out. This isn't the story. This bomb, land, this bomb went flying horizontally between a couple of us. This is, a, this is later on after we got the guy out and took a photo of it. Uh, he, he's a very cool guy, Werner. Oh, he was. He, um, he, shipped, he could see the bombs coming down towards the abseil rope and he knew that if a bomb hit the abseil rope, that would be really serious for him. And so he moved sideways and he, and he avoided it. The bomb is actually a bomb. The bomb missed the rope by about a metre, the ropes. But another little one hit him on his knee and, and shed his trousers a lot. So he, he, he patted that out, it was alright. And then we, we took a couple of minutes to get contact with him. We decided we should bring him out. But we weren't sure if the rope was damaged. So we brought him out and um, we didn't have enough chance to go back in that year. Not many of us wanted to actually. <laughs> But anyway, I, I went back to Erebus in 2000. It was my next, my next time back in Erebus. I had, I, I decided that um, people kept on asking me to go down with, take, go down with them, help them get gas. And I said, look, it's too dangerous. And by this time, I was married and had kids, and it's just too dangerous. But in 2003, my kids were mostly grown up, <laughs> and um, I'd lived with Karen for you know, enough years. <laughs> So, and this was, this, was a, this was a year that, um, that Phil hadn't seen any eruptions for, since March. This was the longest period there hadn't been any eruptions. You know, usually there'd, there'd be eruptions that you could see on the seismometers every, every day or so, and, and, and um, or, you know, every, several times a day, and, and every day would be a big one, most days. So he hadn't seen anything for, for all those months, from March to... December, and then we looked into the crater. Looked into the crater. It was all snowy. Usually, it's not snowy. And so I anguished over this for a couple of days, and because this is a, this is a, this is outside this is outside authorization. You're not you're, you're not allowed to go into. You're not even meant to go into here. You're going down to here. But I was <clears throat> I was part of the U.S. program, but I wasn't the you know, American, so I figured it wouldn't apply to me. So anyway, we went down and this with this guy, this American student, came down with me, and uh, we came down and got right down to the um, run of the fire pit. And here's the photograph of the lava lake from there. Just slowly, slowly, these are slow rolls of lava. People reckon, people who know this stuff reckon you, reckon you can walk across here. Oh, yeah. but I, I didn't try to this guy. Fortunately, I couldn't Fortunately, I couldn't get down here because if I had it, I probably would have tried. <laughs> but it's, it's pretty amazing. I, you know, you possibly can walk across no. it. It's so thick. People, people talk about how wide to walk across lava flows that are moving. Which, which, um, and there's other stories of people getting trapped and walking across them. So you can see the gas mask. No special gear. Hard helmet and gas mask. Ice axe, crampons. And climbing gear to get, get up the steep wall. But we didn't have to... We didn't have to use climbing gear from the bottom of the main crater. We just scurried across here and down. With one little, one little steep part, we backed down, but it was, it was very straightforward. 
So very, very satisfying after 30 years or so, to 25 years to get trying to get down here. Okay, back to Erebus. One of the, one of the main things I pointed out to a few people: these towers that that uh, grow above warm ground. Um, the, the ground's steaming in places, and places it's too hot for the ice to form. But a place where it's not quite hot enough, and yet there's enough steam. These hollow chimneys of ice form. My, my friend calls this Harry's dream. <laughs> <laughs> this is Harry's dream when it's lower. <laughs> a bit frigid, isn't it? <laughs> and this is a. I can't remember the name of this one. This is us looking for a My friend and I are trying to find a way in. In 2006, this is a, quite a big one. There's, there's hundreds of them up here. We've, we've explored maybe a hundred. Each time we go there, we, we go into more ones and, and good ones that have been doing in the past. And they're, they're incre they have incredible um, ice formations. We found one really neat one in 06, which um, was just the most amazing crystal. And I think this might be part of the most amazing crystal system. Where there's, a ladder, there's ladders for getting in. Easier than going down on ropes. Too much like hard work. Although there's one cave we call a sauna cave, it's too far for a ladder. We have to have sail down and climb back up, which is a bit of a drag. <coughs> this, this is another Washington Coast photograph. There's my mate over there. Is it, some of these are there's huge, they're huge um, things. You, you know, you can you can go for uh, maybe a hundred meters on some some of them. So Karen told some of you a, a, a um, few lies, I think. Uh, but I don't have any questions. You got any questions, Bill? Yeah. But rather than risk life of wind to get into Erebus to get gas samples, why can't you put a uh, gas sample canister on a fine wire cable and fire it in with a harpoon or a crossbow or something? Well, they have tried that. Didn't work. They have tried uh, a couple of goes at that. That kind of things. Um, Never worked, and they, they eventually tried to send a robot down. Uh, lots of fanfare, and it got eight meters. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's theoretically possible, but uh, I guess it's not as much fun. <laughs> but, um, but it hasn't. The interest, the interest has gone off actually getting the samples. Although people would still, I know, I know people that have still ask me to go to, go down. Um, but it's, yeah, so I guess they don't want the samples enough to organise what you're talking about. Yeah. How does this volcano compare to the one on uh, Heard Island? Big Ben on Heard Island. It's much more active. Um, Big Ben's basaltic, isn't it? It's on the basaltic series anyway. Um, it's a much, it's a, not such a shield volcano. It's, it, it, Big Ben's had a couple of eruptions in the last 50 years, but this one has. Is perhaps all time. Um, Harry, a, a very noticeable thing from the outside, anyway, is that uh, Erebus has two slopes: a, a shallower outer slope, and then, then sort of a much steeper slope. Does that correspond to different eruptions, different different periods, or different lab, different composition of lava? It's, the, it's all uh, apart from the thing. It's all pretty much the same composition. Is it Roy's and Evans, Kenyite, it is, and what that change is a different period. The change of slope is um, all, all above the change of slope is it, it's much younger. Um, that change of slope is the edge of the old caldera when there was a huge amount of lava came out then the thing collapsed and you made a hole. Then the new thing filled the hole and grew it grew bigger. Question, what kind of measurements are you doing in the crater? Well, um, inside the crater, you, you, you start from the rocks to, to understand the evolution of the magma and the growth of the crystals, but you can also get those from outside the crater. Um, so, you can do most things you can do from the crater rim, like looking at the chemistry of the gas looking at the style of the, the magma movement, the style of the eruptions. So going inside the crater, it's, um, I guess it's just getting a closer view. Elsa? Do you know if anyone else has been here since? No, no one has.
Now it's uh, ever since the big eye well, it's, it's, it's been erupting several times a day since since then. We had that one little window. People have tried to go in before, and they haven't. They haven't been properly equipped. They didn't take some Americans didn't take gas masks down, which is the stupidest thing they do. Um, and they won them. One attempt they got. This is before we went there. The, um, a couple of years before, they, one of them got very sick. They didn't do anything else for the rest of the trip. He just basically stayed in the hut. He got gassed. So I mean, it's there are some obvious things you, you do to, to manage the risks, and yeah, they didn't do that. Are Same. there any other rock types there apart from King Yard? No, only King Yard. Fang's got Fang's got more trachytic apparently, um, but a bit more like Hut Point. Mm. Okay, well I think that's it. So I think we should um, have, have, have a, a drink, eh? Yeah.